Paul, before we get to this series and the Florida Panthers, I want you to think back to all the times you've watched the Stanley Cup final and watched someone hoist the Stanley Cup. Are there one or two that jump to mind right away? Well, all of the Detroit Red Wings in 2002, because I think I was still on the ice when that happened. Uh, Rod Brindamore. Mm. More for an understanding of what Roddy was willing to do to be a player of the hours. But in truth, it's because Jim Rutherford was up in the press box and I knew what it meant to him. So that one, that one's impactful for me. I've watched uh, all of the Stanley Cup champion playoff games every year. So if we miss the playoffs, you get beat in the first round. I won't watch another game. It's too emotional, right? I didn't get invited to a party. So uh, I'll wait till the summer and then I'll, I'll go back and I'll watch all those games. But I did watch, uh, I did watch Jimmy Stanley Cup. Um, I was just happy for him. 21 years ago was your first game behind the bench in a Stanley Cup final. What do you remember about it and what's going to be different Saturday? I remember walking out to the bench and Brian Englum did an interview and I couldn't stop smiling. And I, I think he actually said, like, is there something you know that we don't? And I'm going like, it's the Stanley Cup final, man. Like being so, oh my God, so good. Ronnie Francis scored in overtime and that building went dead quiet. I mean, because it couldn't happen. Right? The, the team was so good. Ten Hall of Famers, I think, on it and Scotty Bowman. So I remember that. Because I didn't know that I would expect that. There was actually a complete absence of tension because it was such an awesome thing, right? Like you so caught up in, I've had a handful of moments like that. Sorry for taking this for a walk. But no. like my fourth game in the NHL was in the Forum in Montreal. And I'm standing behind the bench. Do you remember when the cameras were to be on the platform like five rows up? So when they do the national anthem, my dad was born in Montreal. We watched all the Hab games growing up. Well, they do. You you had a, vic, a picture of all the Canadian players standing on the blue line. Like it wasn't that far off me standing behind the bench. I was like a five year old kid. I'm standing behind the bench in the form of Montreal. So I've had a handful of those, and I had that. National anthems are always awesome. I enjoy them. You know, standing behind the bench when they go, and and I remember taking that in, thinking like this just cannot possibly get any better than it is. And then we lost in triple overtime in Game Three, and reality set in <laughs> you know we've um we've had a lot of fun on this podcast over the past few weeks um trying to compare your florida panthers to the 2012 los angeles kings well one of us has had a lot of fun with that brandon montour is drew dowdy and carter verhage is justin williams with the clutch goal scoring and barkoff playing the role of kopitar etc 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 it's been fun but you've been around hockey a long time are there any players on your team or does this team in general remind you of any other teams? Like are there elements of your Panthers that remind you of something else? No. And I'm sure there are if I had given it deep thought, but that's what's unique about this. So I got off the phone with each player in the summertime. I talked to him. We just did one word about hockey, just an introduction talk. I got off the phone and, and Jamie Compon, by the way, is the one connection between the 2012 mm, and our team. He was assistant call. coach for both of them. Nice. And, and did talk about that at some point in January when we had to close by eight points. You can win the Stanley Cup as the eighth seed, hmm. it, you, but your game has to be dialed in and right. Very similar, right? They made the playoffs, I think, in the last game or two of the year as well. They were an eighth right seed. Very, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, What's special about these guys is how darn unique they are. They are in a good mood all the time, even when you're hard on them, but not, not in a bad way. They are positive. They are upbeat. They are laughing all the time. They are funny as hell. And that's okay. And I learned that from them. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to enjoy the moment because they work hard enough. They work so hard that even a bad result is not a problem. Work your butt off and have fun. Right? Those are the two rules. But the work your butt off hard is really hard to get to. So I'm not just saying you got to compete at a hard level mm -hmm. that in the third period of a game when you're working your, and there's all this tension and somebody says something funny, you can laugh. Because there's nothing else for you to do basically on the ice. You're going as hard as you can. And that was funny. So I've had a heck of a time with that. Well, Kachuk kind of talked about that a little bit. Like this has been the spring of Kachuk on the ice and off it. Right. 
And he talked about how the two of you guys learned to trust where he could get to another level. Like he was a good player, but now he's an even better player. Right. So I'm wondering about maybe that phone call you had with him or how you developed that trust. How did you get Matthew Kachuk from here to there? I didn't, but I watched him. So we have a certain route that you're supposed to run on a breakout. And on the bench, he doesn't run the route three times. So go down and tell him I want you to run an inside route on that. Okay. Then I want watch the video. He was right. I was wrong. Now, you run the route because the coach says run the route. But in the situation that prevented him, it was the wrong route, and he ran the route. And that's when I learned, you know, you can learn more, ask him questions, and, and learn from him more than I'm going to teach him. I do believe that Jamie Compon has had a major impact on him. Jamie does a lot of individual video, defensively small things. They're not trying to change his game. Small things that make him a little bit better. And after that, it's no impact. I mean, I've sat in awe of this young man, and it's not, you made sure that oh, it's not on the ice. Yeah, it's on the ice. He's unbelievable hands, mm -hmm. scores these huge goals. I mean, I didn't like him in Winnipeg, right? Like, he just kept he kept doing that to us, right? He'd drive you nuts all game. It'd be a tight game. And then two minutes left, he'd score. It had to be him, right? Why did it have to be that guy? And then you get around him. You should see him move around the room, truly. The uh, first week he was in town, he took all the trainers out for dinner. Okay, that's smart, right? He does it once. Except that's how he treats it. He's polite to the bus driver, right? He teaches, he treats the flight attendants with respect. He has this great way of moving around there. Now he's got some bark to him too. Mm -hmm. And and he'll encourage the defenseman to move the puck quicker and closer to his tape <laughs> at, at times. But but he never separates himself. What I if you go look at statistically his season, in around January, he stopped taking penalties. In a, in a, I think in a 16 game set, he had four games with penalties. Two or two minute penalties. So it was just a one minute minor. And then two were like 17 and one was against Otto and his brother started. Or, so that's there, but he stopped taking penalties. He's not in the penalty box anymore and he scored. But here's the other stat. He actually has a higher scoring rate in his first few years. He'd have a higher scoring rate when he did take a penalty. So we needed to figure out a way to get him to keep the higher scoring rate, but get rid of the penalties because he doesn't need them. Uh, he'll be a hard man. And if it gets on the ice and it gets going, he's probably in the middle of it. But away from it, He's not starting fires anymore. He's just playing the game. Hmm. You know, we, um, we spoke with Bruce Cassidy, and one of the questions we asked was, where is this series going to be won? And we talked about neutral zone. That's, that's an obvious conversation. But the one area that he pointed out was the slot. That's where this thing is going to be won, according to Bruce Cassidy. According to Paul Maurice, where is this series going to be won? Yeah, I don't want to tell you that because it's critical to us. They have some things. So they have two or three things that they're very, very good at, a lead at. And eventually, he's right. The game always ends up to the net front, right? The percentage of goals that score from the slot is so much, and the inner slot are just, you're scoring at like 4% outside of them. So for sure. So how does it get there, right? Each team is going to try to get the puck in the slot really in different ways. They're going to do everything they can to keep us from getting it the way we do. And we're going to do everything we can to get them, stop them. But theirs is different. So we've seen versions of their game in Toronto and um, Boston. Not so much uh, Carolina, who got a ton of slot shots on us. Don't get me wrong. Mm. But yeah, we will both try to take the strengths away. And as the underdog, we will pay particular attention to it. Is that where your team wants to be? The underdog? You have no choice. I mean, that's now you don't really choose your, your your spot in that. But is that where you're most comfortable? I think right now, yes. I think I think in order to not be to be a powerful favorite, you have to have experience at it. So, going from 16th to first, we're banging out 122 points in a year. You you haven't earned the right to be a favorite on a good year. You have to have some depth to it. You've got to have lost for a little bit of a while. You have to go through some battles, get to the conference final, get to the final, get you know in that. And then you, you step on the ice and say, yeah, we're older. 
we're more skilled and, and we're the favorite. And then you can carry that mantle. We're good being the underdog right now. And it's just true. So somebody asked me about me playing the underdog card against Boston. There's no card. <laughs> There's 7,000 points ahead of us. And I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to steer the, the messaging here. We're the underdog. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the place all teams have to start. Paul, thanks. Okay, Good guys. luck. Good to see you again. Yeah, great to see you. Be well. All right. Thanks, guys. Good luck, sir.